Hello and welcome to episode 242 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, how are you doing? I'm, I'm very good, Andy. We've been, we've done a lot this week. Mm. The big thing is we launched the Facebook group and we talked about it last week on the podcast. We just took action, shipped it, started it, and it's been brilliant. I mean, we're really pleased with it because it was something that you wanted. There was a demand from the listeners. And after the event that we did in a couple of weeks ago, and the group has turned out just as I'd hoped it would. So people are going in there. They're being helpful. They're not sort of criticizing point scoring. I know the rules of the group, which you would have read if you got in there, says that if you do that, you're out. There's no, <laughs> yeah. no, no three strike policy <laughs> here. You, you're gone. We, because- we always had trust in our, in our listeners and, and, and people who engage with us because we know the kind of people they are. They're, we're not that kind of a group. So. No. So it's been, it's been fantastic. So people have been putting questions in there. There's been, I'll just give you a, a, just a brief sort of smattering of some of the topics about building income portfolios, about company pensions, whole of life insurance policies, questions about ETFs, card readers for small businesses, best books. That was actually a question that I asked out. I wanted people to tell me the best money book or business book they've read and a, another best non-fiction book, which is it's a really interesting read because I'm always fascinated by the recommendations. I like to go on recommendations for books that I read because... Um, there's a lot to get through out there in terms of the money world as well. And it's nice to see things that people have actually uh, found useful. So if you are interested in reading, then join the group anyway, because you can find that post and bookmark it. Uh, FIRE movement is always a popular one. So FIRE, the financial independence retire early was a topic that came up and it will probably be one that comes up again and again. And now we've got a couple of moderators, obviously people like Andy are admins in the group. And we've got moderators that are some of you guys out there who are helping to moderate the comments etc so get involved if you go and find the money to the masses community uh, group you can just search that on facebook or there is a url which is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses join the group you'll be accepted almost immediately and then you can uh, join in the conversation help be helpful start uh, conversations i do appear in there from time to time it's not um, a group that is directed at me deliberately so so you'll hear or you'll see me make comments every now and then but I and you read pretty much every comment i read everything yeah, yeah. i read everything that goes in there so i do try and hold back because i want the it to be a community the thing is in the world of finance you have to be careful because there is a tendency for people just to not to listen to other people and allow other people to talk and also not to appreciate other people's knowledge and so in a community the way it works best is if you allow people to talk and they can help each other out from experience we talked about it in a a podcast recently um, about having uh, empathy for people in certain situations and so for example women may have a situation that I can't have true empathy for because I've never been in so we want to allow that to happen and allow people to be able to talk share experience and knowledge there's no right or wrong answers a lot of it is just views and opinion as well it's not financial advice so get involved ask questions do try and help people in there and give your view on something like I say no one's going to beat you down and it's been brilliant so I'm really enjoying that and I'm just looking over my shoulder now at the number it's about 460 which is pretty good going given that the group is only a few days old so join in we're going to get grow that group to uh, an enormous number yeah and actually invite your friends i mean the money is a difficult there was there was a big campaign on telly recently that talked about talking about money the difficult issue with talking about money and with inheritance and everything else and it was a, a big campaign i don't know if you saw it but it is a difficult thing but maybe in a light-hearted group like this and you can you can spread the conversation get people involved and the other thing on that actually which is important is when we did our event we if you if you came to the event you would have seen that we allow people to ask questions anonymously via a technology bit of software and because of that we must have had i mean we were counted we've still got some of those questions probably in our q a session which is obviously a small part of what was there normally you get probably one or two people put their hand up we must have had about 70 80 questions asked yeah and so in the group we allow people to ask questions anonymously so you can go in there if you have a question and you can ask it by going to one of the moderators and well it's actually lauren that we have to pose the question to or andy in fact and they will put it on there anonymously so it'll appear as if the question came from them even though it doesn't 
And we've had people do it already because I understand that sometimes people don't want to ask particularly personal questions. So um, that's the Facebook group. The other thing I just want to mention is I'm looking at the wall of love, which I don't think I've mentioned on the podcast yet. If you remember when we first had Money to the Masses Towers, we had our office a few years ago, we took um, a load of the feedback you had given us over the years. And some of you wrote in to specifically appear on the wall of love, which is the stuff that you said of what you like about what we do and across the whole platform from AG20 Investor, the podcast, the book, the website, etc. And it's been put into a, a design on a decal on the wall. And if you go on our Instagram, you will see some pictures of it. And I think it might have been on our twi- my Twitter profile too. So we've got a new one put up. So go and have a look at it. I'm looking at one down here, one that says I'm a big fan of the podcast, which is nice. And we have small bits of writing. I will share more and zoom in more on it on our um, social media because it's great for you to see it. Finally, before we move on with the show, don't forget to review the podcast on iTunes. We've had... No reviews in almost a month, which is unbelievable. So please do pop on there, chuck a review. The last one we had was fantastic, actually. It was really uh, We good. might even pull it out and um, do some social stuff around it. But please do review the uh, podcast. Right, good stuff. So what have we got coming up on this week's pod? So I'm not doing an investment piece this week. And um, Midweek's market show has gone out already, and you've probably listened to that. Partly because markets are all over the place as I make this podcast because it seems to be the most optimistic day in the world ever we seem to be having some resolution or solution to the everything (laughs) everything u.s trade war with china brexit probably global warming everything (laughs) and so markets are all over the place and it's quite interesting to watch so get out your stock market app and have a look what's been happening particularly on the pound it's surged uh, ridiculously in the last 24 hours so i'm going to have a break from investing i'm going to do a couple of pieces that are related to uh, one is a result of an email stamp duty so there are some stamp duty traps that i want to talk about or things you should be aware of that people are falling foul of um one of them is a slightly disappointing for somebody who wrote in i'm doing it anonymously because they wrote in and asked for my help via an email and unfortunately they're just in a situation that they can't get out of um, and so I want to warn other people about it because it's easy to do. Um, will writing. If you've not got a will, I'll, this piece is for you because it's about how you can get one cheaply and quickly and piggy banking. Now, when we did the event, it was something that I touched upon uh, about how to manage your money and savings and finances, about apportioning some of your salary, etc. Some people have asked if I could focus that on a bit more. So it's going back to basics. So I want to quickly touch on that. Good stuff. What are we going to start with? Let's just do the stamp duty because it's a slightly meatier piece and I want to make sure we get all the info out there and not rushed. Now, of course, when you sell a house and you might want to go and buy another house, so you pay stamp duty. So you pay stamp duty when you buy a property. Now, the amount of stamp duty you pay is dependent on on the price of the house and also your situation so not everybody pays the same amount to give you a quick overview you can find out more on the rates if you go to the money advice service they have the various different rates now if you were just a normal person going along and i'm not talking about a first-time buyer here if you went and bought a house that was valued under one hundred twenty-five thousand pound, then there's no stamp duty on it. If it's valued between one hundred twenty-five and two hundred fifty thousand pounds, then you pay two percent on the portion that falls within that band. So it's done in bands. So the next band is between two hundred fifty and nine hundred twenty-five thousand pounds. That portion of a property value is charged at five percent stamp duty tax. And then the next band is between 925k and 1.5 million. That band's at 10%. And over 1.5 million is done at 12%. So this is a tax that just basically goes to the government's coffers. So it's dead money. It's gone. And it's one that's slightly controversial. Now, first time buyers do have a slightly different rule. They have a up to the price of 300,000 pounds. They don't have to pay stamp duty on a property so that can be a saving of five grand in tax so that's a concession for first-time buyers now it's va- it has to be on a property that's valued under five hundred thousand. if you go above five hundred thousand, so you're fortunate enough that your first house is over 500 grand <laughs> they think well you don't need our help <laughs> you don't need our help and you're going to be paying the same stu- stamp duty as somebody who is not a first-time buyer and of course the other important change to stamp duty rate in pre- in recent years was where they 
had an additional rate. So this is particularly impacts the buy to let landlords out there. So if you have a second property, so if you buy a second property, then you pay a, an additional 3% on top of the rates that I mentioned earlier across those bands. So it's an additional 3% charge that's placed on the value of your house. And that is paid as tax. And the one caveat on that is that or concession is probably the best word, is that that second property has to be valued over 40 grand. Now, that seems fairly straightforward, I suppose. But the issue is, as they've changed these rules over time, there's been some cracks which people have fallen down, and it can cause slight issues. So I'm going to go straight in on an email that I received. Now, I'm going to paraphrase it, and I'm going to do it anonymously. So effectively, we had a situation where a lady emailed in and said she was fretting and, and and unfortunately she's now in a quite upset state I think what happened she's spoken to quite a few accountants but she said that she misunderstood what they were telling her so in her situation she had a house so she lived in a house that she owned she also had a an existing buy to let property so a small buy to let property which provided her with an income now before the rules on this additional stamp duty rate came in if you already owned property second property then it was fine that was it was no retrospective taxes applied so she owned these properties she wasn't liable for any additional stamp duty rates or anything like that at the point the rules came in so what happened is she decided that she wanted to move from her main residence where she lived her buy to let was going to still be there as her buy to let and she was going to buy a new house which she was going to move in personally and sell her existing house that she was living in. Now, when the rules first came in about second properties, there was an issue where the rules didn't allow for the fact that somebody could just move from one house to the other and they had to, they were going to start to apply this additional rate. So they had to sort of massage that and fix that slight issue. Now, in theory, it should be that that lady could have done that. She could have sold her main residence and bought another residence without incurring an additional rate of stamp duty because like I say they'd fix that kind of crack that people fell down where they were saying hold on you've got multiple uh, properties when the rules came in the problem is in this instance for this lady what happened is she was keen to sell the property that she had at her main house and therefore move and she didn't want to lose the sale and she also was putting an offer in on a new house but for reasons of the surveys etc that property fell through what happened is she decided to ensure the sale of her own property she sold it moved out into her buy to let temporarily and then she was going to buy the other property to be our main residence but that fell through in the end anyway the problem is that by doing that, by not moving from her main residence to a new main residence, by selling and moving across, she actually caused herself to be stuck because she now is in a position where she is in a buy-to-let. She owns a property, it's hers, so she's living in it. Now she is deemed, if she goes to buy another house which she actually wants to ultimately live in, that is now deemed as a second property and she'll have to pay the additional 3% rate on stamp duty on top of what she would have had to pay on what will be her her main residence because effectively i suppose what she's done there but almost by accident without realizing she's transferred her residency to her buy to let property in that smaller place that she never had any intention in staying in it's exactly what she did and it wasn't an intention but of course where she finds herself is that she is now in that buy to let property can't afford the stamp duty additional rate to be able to buy the house she wants So she is stuck. The only way she can get out of it is if she sells her buy-to-let property and then goes and buys a new house to live in. Then she won't have to pay that additional rate. But it means she has to sell her buy-to-let property. Which she's relying on for an income. income. So unfortunately, what's happened is the quirk of the rules and the way they work means that she is now, unfortunately, seemingly stuck. And... I only tell this story because my understanding of the rules are that that is the case. She's spoken to apparently three accountants who've confirmed that is the case. So if there's anybody out there who happens to be a specialist in tax who says there is a a, a glimmer of light for her then do get in touch yeah. because I would love to know that there was one. And if there but, is, we'll, we'll spread the word well, and, and we'll write an article and we'll, exactly. we'll get it out there. 
But of course, with all the research we've looked around the, the topic that's out there, it doesn't seem to be anyway. So the reason we mentioned on the podcast is that I want to make people aware that there are these pitfalls that you have to be aware of. That if you have existing property, so you have more than one, you have to be careful how you start to sell these things, and because then you could be liable for this additional rate of tax and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it can be get to a point where you're forced to either live in one you don't want to or have to sell them. Moving on from that though, when we had the event, there was. Emily, who worked at Habito, raised a really interesting point about first-time buyer stamp duty. Now, if you remember at the beginning of this piece, I said that the first-time buyers get a concession, so they don't have to pay stamp duty on a on the first 300000 on a property that's worth under half a million. Now, Emily pointed out that when she was buying a house, she bought her first place, which was, I, I think she said, may have been a, a, a flat or something like that. And she was highlighting to people that you need to sometimes plan don't rush to get onto the property ladder because she got onto the property ladder and as we were doing the event i think she was like seven months pregnant or something and she was saying obviously they were buying now another property they were having to sell that original property because they were going to have a baby as they planned to go and then have to buy a bigger house for that to be able to have their family live in and maybe it was they wanted to move to have a bigger space or whatever and of course as she pointed out that you end up paying multiple stamp duty taxes if you move because every time you buy a house you're having to pay stamp duty so the idea that young people sometimes will get i mean i shouldn't say young people but it's anybody might rush to get on the property ladder because they always feel it's the best thing rather than renting just delaying it by a year or two would have meant that Emily said in her scenario she would have only just bought the one house rather than the two. The other issue is because the concession is for a first time buyer, if you bought a house that didn't use that full concession, so let's just say you bought a house for £200,000, then you haven't had to pay stamp duty as your first house because it's under that £300,000 threshold. But if you have bought a house that was worth 300000 a few years later, which you might have been able to afford to do because you might have planned to have a baby, etc., or a family, or just move, you would have had that full concession on the property you used the full 300,000 and so just by delaying a decision by a year or two would mean that you could actually we did the numbers when we? we were looking at the numbers and saying like what would be the worst case scenario if someone bought their first house quickly that was small and then they bought a house that was worth say three four hundred grand and um, a, a year or two later and effectively you could miss out on about four and a half grand's worth of um, concession on or saving on stamp duty tax. that was comparing a hundred and fifty thousand house uh, to a three hundred thousand house um, so yes. yeah it's a massive saving so a massive difference it's it's not a trap but it's just to make people aware that if they're a first time buyer and they are living in somewhere like London let's be honest I know some people will be living around the country and they'll be thinking that 300,000 is a huge amount for uh, your first house well it, it is but obviously in London there'll be people who will achieve that then bear in mind that you might be missing out on your concession because you can't use up the rest of that allowance and you, you only get one go at it as, as I very well know yeah so <laughs> (laughs) that's it one shot the final thing i want to mention on the stamp duty before we move on is of course there was that possible change to the rules when it comes to stamp duty the last thing i want to mention just before we move on from stamp duty is the possible change in the rules that can occur and this is for accidental landlords i'm really sort of aiming at now when you sell a house and you move on then you could go and say live in a different property but what happens you're primary residence relief so when we have a house we don't have to pay capital gains tax i'm referring to capital gains tax here so it's not stamp duty but you don't have to pay capital gains tax on your primary residence problem is that sometimes you need to move quickly and you don't get chance to sell your other house quick enough etc so what you have you have the last it used to be 36 months but it's now 18 months gray so even if you don't live in a house the last 18 months is always deemed that you were so there's no tax to pay because if you owned a house you moved out of it and you rented it and did all sorts of things then they will start to portion down the amount of the property the the value etc and the gain to work out how much tax you have to pay if you've always lived in a house as your primary residence then you aren't going to have to pay capital gains tax but there is this like you say they always assume the last 18 months you've lived in it regardless of whether you have so that's class as you're giving you like the full 
primary residence relief. That might be cut to nine months from April 2020. So we've got to keep an eye on that. So this isn't a stamp duty tip. It's a capital gains tax tip, but I think it fits in quite nicely. So something to be aware of, aware of, especially as I know we're getting to the period where people are looking for schools and people are moving houses for schools and they're having to move very quickly and move out of a property. And then the window that you have in which to sell a house to ensure you don't have to pay any tax on it at all the tax might be minimal anyway, but you don't have to pay anything. May be reduced from 2020, so just keep an eye out for it. Good stuff. So that piece there was a, a real reminder of nuances that, that exist. If you've got any sort of question, any sort of thing that you can think that, that we could help either answer or if you wanted to highlight an issue that's happened to you, then, then get in touch because this is the sort of stuff that gets onto the podcast, gets onto the community, gets people talking and we can help spread the word and, and, and answer these things. And of course, make sure you seek advice before you make a transaction. That's the important thing because you can't undo these things once they've happened. So speak to an accountant, make sure you understand what they're telling you and then make a decision after that. Good stuff. So we're going to be moving on to piggy banking next. We've touched on it briefly before, but we're going to, people have been asking about it. So we're going yeah, to be talking so, about it. So what happens is it's the idea of trying to control your money. And the idea of piggy banking is based around the, in the past, people might have had envelopes. So when we did a, a piece about teaching school children about money, we talked about the idea of putting money in different envelopes. So you could teach them to put money in an envelope for frivolous things, something for longer term saving, maybe a holiday in the future to spend some money on when they're away or something for more short term. It's trying to teach children by divvying up their pocket money into one of three envelopes that they it allows them to uh, use their money wisely. And it was a good education piece and teachers are trying to teach kids to do that as well. So Taking that idea, obviously, you can apply that to your main finances and when you save as well. So one of the things is we've gone, if you go back and find the 50, 30, 20 rule, we did a podcast on it. And it's the idea that when you get your salary comes in your earnings, then 50% of it you should be spending on things like your bills, the stuff you have to. You can have 30% on savings. So that might be putting into savings account or maybe including things like pensions. And of course, the 20% that's left over, therefore, but can be more discretionary. These are ideals. I'm not sure based on some of the things you read and even our Facebook group, they're really uh, always realistic, but that's the idea. So it's a very simple concept of trying to divvy your money up in that way, trying to assign what you should be trying to do. But there, there are other ways of doing it. You can try and divvy your money up in categories. So you could be doing budget. So you could be sitting there thinking, this is how much I'm going to spend on food. This is how much I'm going to spend on going out. And the thing is, it gets more and more complicated the more pots you have. But the more pots you have, ironically, the more control you have. So if you can, as I always say, if you can quantify something, you can control it. So if you know how much is going to go into each pot, how much money you have, then you can try and um, control it. So I suppose in years gone by, they might have had a pot of money that was for their rent and things like that. And there'd be some people who may still do that. But there's a couple of points really is that you can do this now using technology. So you don't have to be doing it with the old piggy bank style because people like the idea of using envelopes or using divvying money up. But how do you do it in a modern day? And now one of the things that I often said is big picture budgeting. So very simple concept where it's still at this point in time, banking in the UK is free. So you could go and open up many bank accounts and many current accounts with different banks if you want to. And it means that you can then get paid into one of the accounts, your money goes in, you set up direct debits that can immediately bounce the money out into each different account that you've opened. You have an account that's designated for your, say, bills, one that's for your discretionary spending, one for your going down the pub or one for savings, all those different things. Of course, when you open up multiple accounts, there are some searches on your credit record you have to bear in mind. But what happens if you automate everything? So your money hits the main account, it bounces out immediately via um, standing orders into all the other accounts. It means that you guarantee that you'll pay your bills in each account that the money then subsequently goes into. You set up direct debits to pay your credit card, your mortgage, all those things to ensure that they are paid. 
And also it means that you have more control because you don't have to put an overdraft on the one that's your going down the pub account. And so it means that at any moment, if you want to see whether you've got the money to go out or the money to buy food, you go to the relevant account, you take out the card from your wallet, go to the ATM or check online, you can see how much money you've got left. But the, the thing is now there are a number of apps that are starting to allow you to do a lot of this within one account. So Monzo allows you to set up spending categories, for example. So they'll start to automatically divvy up your money as you spend it. So you don't have to go and check. You spend your money and then it will take it out of your, um, for example, your um, food budget and stuff like that. I mean, Emma app. So Emma is in the name. I mean, that's a, I, I like that app. That does a similar thing, but it does it across multiple Banks, you can have lots of banks or your credit card, which is quite good. So let's say you've got a credit card you like to spend on because you get the points and you have a current account. If you spend on any of those accounts, you can link them up into the Emma app. And what it does, it just treats them, it pulls them all down and it sees what you're spending across the whole board and go, right, Damien, you spent X amount of £100 on food so far this month. You're about 80% of your budget. It will send you warning signs that you might overspend. It tells you when particular... Uh, transactions are likely to come out based on previous spending it will even tell you things like how much money you got until the next payday and whether you might run out so it's very clever and i and i do like the idea of it because it means it gives you an overview of your finances you don't have to quite be into the piggy banking and separate pots you can use your existing ways of spending but immediately you can see for example you might have a budget for how much petrol you use and you can see where how close you are to going over so It'll also find wasteful subscriptions. So if you're someone who's not sort of on top of there, I mean, you should be if you're thinking about spending, but it will actually look at your bank account and it will find wasteful subscriptions and, and, and be able to tell you how much you're spending on certain stuff. Like, for example, when I first went on to Emma, I, I use Emma myself, it told me I'd spent something like two or £300 on, on um, bank charges. Now, these are packaged account charges, not late fees. And immediately I, I realised I wasn't getting any worth from that, so I, I just cut it down, cut it out. And the so other thing they do clever. is they look at your direct debits that are coming through and it can predict when they're coming, so it can tell you... So say I, I got paid today, and it knows that I won't get paid for 30 days it will predict already how much I've got left based on the typical all the bills that come out of my typical spending how much I'm going to have left and similarly if you're running ahead of where you would normally be and you've actually spent more money in a month and it knows that direct debit is coming it will send you a warning to say I don't know your council tax is due to come out that's 200 pounds that will put you in your overdraft yeah so that it's that sort of preemptive alert that that's fintech is really pushing it's pushing and 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 i like the emma one because it links to lots of things um so it doesn't have to be through your bank account you don't have to open an account with monzo for example so there are are other solutions out there now before i move on from that one thing i have to say that it does do which i quite like is it will tell you if say you have a direct debit that comes out every month so a mobile phone bill then it goes up it was higher than the previous month it flags it or if it's dropped. So you can see if your standard bills have gone up or down. And I've done that to notice that bills have been increased without me quite realising. And then you look into why and you can contact the providers. So it stops any of that stealth um, mm-hmm. increasing of bills that come along and it makes you therefore look at things. So it's a great way of being able to manage your finances. So it's a piggy banking is the principle, but there are some very simple ways. I mean, literally you download these apps and within minutes you're all plugged in and you can start to therefore quantify what's going on. And if you can't quantify it, you can't control it. The other thing I would like to throw in as a thought to all of this is the idea of paying yourself first, which is a general principle of if you're going to put money into pension uh, savings or whatever it is you should do that as one of your bills that goes into a savings account somewhere else because then it just becomes one of your usual subscriptions so therefore it comes out and starts small it doesn't have to be big but it means that it becomes part of the overall pattern of spending and therefore you don't miss the money so i mean that's the idea of piggy banking it's going back to basics it's taken uh, a step back but i know a lot of you have asked for it and i think it's very useful so we've got plenty of articles on the website that look at big picture budgeting they look at monzo they look at starling they look at best budgeting apps as well um, so i'll put a link to the best budgeting apps on the podcast notes and also we'll probably speak about it in the community probably on monday i'll uh, i'll raise the question and we'll start chatting about it yeah because there'll be nuances to each of these that people do and don't like and they're not perfect i mean 
think Emma's not. I absolutely guarantee you that it's not because there are bits in it which frustrate me, but that's just down to general accounting ideas and stuff like that. But anyway. Good stuff. Right. So final piece on the podcast, we're going to be looking at wills. Yeah. So I bang on about wills a lot. So the idea that people need to look at whether they need a will. So if you don't know, do Damien's Money MOT. So look at for Damien's Money MOT on the site. Part of that is about having a will and it's ask you questions and then it will take you through how you can achieve it now of course there's multiple reasons to have a will which i won't go into but loosely some of them are down to like you have children because you can then say who looks after them you have assets you want to give away um, you want to stipulate who gets them it might be to mitigate inheritance tax etc but october marks free will month so every year, and I think they do it in March as well, a number of organisations get together and offer free wills. And these organisations are charities like Age UK, British Heart Foundation, Prostate Cancer UK. They normally do the scheme in March and October. But what it does, if you're over 55, then it allows you to get a sort of simple solicitor drafted will for free. Now, around the country, there are about 300 solicitors that take part in the scheme. And so they, I think there's around about 10,000 wills that they allow to have available. Now, if your will is more complex, so it's not just a very sort of fairly simple will that you leave all your money to a certain person or say your businesses, etc., then maybe that this won't be for you. So you might have to go to solicitor anyway. But if you've got, say you have mirror wills, so like a mirror, it's a reflection of the other will. So a couple may want to leave all their assets to each other and the other person's will is very similar they just want to leave all their assets to the other person then only one of you has to be over 55 to uh, benefit now the idea if you want to get involved then go to freewillsmonth.org.uk and you can book an appointment now if you don't qualify for free wills month in over 55 then there are a lot of charities that do this all year round or in particular months so uh, it works in very much the same way that the charities facilitate a will writing service to happen but then in exchange for a donation and of course there's a suggested donation of say a hundred pound or up to like 180 the point is you can get a will at a discount now will aid is one that does it so you can go and look at willaid.org.uk there are other ways you can other schemes out there for charities that do a similar thing uh, where you make donations after having your will done. Um, you do get some union-sponsored wills. If you're a member of a union, then there may be uh, websites or affiliations that you can do through that. Now, if you don't fit into any of those categories, you want something a little bit more, then there are a number of will writing services online. We have reviewed a number of them. Um, probably the most well-known and the biggest one is Fairwill, F-A-R-E. W I L. Now we did a review on it quite some time ago. You can go and find them online. They will do a similar service where you go on, answer a number of questions, basically an online questionnaire, very easy, click through, and then it produces a, a will. So that works out to be around about £90 for an individual, 140 for a couple, and you can then pay £10 a year for unlimited updates. That's up to you. Actually, on this, we have reviewed these, and there is an offer that you can secure where you get a discount on all those prices. So it can be £75 for a single, £125 for a um, for a couple. Now, you can go and find out more about that in the review that we do. Now, beyond them, there is actually a, a company called Beyond, so they do wills. Prices are around £90 an individual, 135 for a couple. Similar idea, you can pay subscription for unlimited updates. I'm not sure that is always worthwhile. Um, and there's another one called Quill and another one called Legal Wills, which you can look at. So go and have a look around. There's no excuse not to do a will. If you require something a little bit more because you've got a business or slightly more complicated circumstances, then you need to go and speak to a solicitor, which will probably cost you um, more than a few hundred pounds it's going to probably cost you that an hour so do have a look now you can find out more on the site we have done a, an article haven't we we have yeah on the best will writing services online one other thing to check if you do use any online will writing services there was a bit of a scandal not long ago where some of them were making it so automatically they were appointed as the executors of your will. So you weren't appointing somebody else yourself because normally what would happen, you'd appoint somebody who might be a similar age to you to be your executor. The reason you do someone typically of a similar age because if you picked an old person, really old person to be your executor, they might die before you do. So you wouldn't really want that. So you tend to pick somebody who's a peer. And what these companies were doing, they were putting themselves as an executor on your will and they would charge an extortioner professional fee to do it. And it was a way of them basically, some of them were actually doing a percentage of assets, which could actually mean that you end up, people inherit less money. 
um, slightly dubious. It was outed in um, one of the national papers. So make sure you check. Fair will don't do that. You can choose them if you want, but you can. That's one of the positives of them is that you can just pick your own executors. So do make sure if you've not got a will, you've not got round to it, especially if you're over 55, you've got no excuse. Go and have a look online. Oh, and just a final thing on that. If you are appointing executors of your will, do try and have make sure you have a conversation with them because they will have to carry out your wishes should you die. And uh, there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of uh, stuff to go through. And uh, it's probably best not to you know hit them with a surprise. They're already dealing with the fact that you're not here and then suddenly you have to divvy out all the money. Right, um, uh, that's it for this week, is it? That's that's it for this week. Join the Facebook group, as um, I mentioned at the start of the podcast. Leave a review. Uh, keep an eye on all our social media profiles. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, we're there. You can email me, usual way, Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Of course, you can email Andy, Andy at moneytothemasses.com. Or if you want to go by Twitter, money to the masses. And hopefully by this time next week, we've got a resolution or solution to the trade war, global warming (laughs) and Brexit all in a lunchtime. Great stuff. See you in the group. (laughs) See you in the group. (laughs) 